Hi everyone, um, as Rob said, I'm Bhavani, I'm Engineering Manager at Peach. Um, and yeah, I thought I'd start out by just saying I'm generally quite a shy person, but I'm just asking the questions today, so I'm sure I'll be okay. Um, so yeah, I think let's start with some intros. Uh, so for each of my panelists, can you please introduce yourself to the, to the group and tell us a little bit about your journey in tech? All right, um, so yes, my name is uh, Roberto Polo. I started in uh, software around 2010. Um, I, my first com uh, company that I ever worked for, we wrote software for compliance, and I swore to myself I would never write software again for compliance. Uh, and then from there, I worked for a company down here in Cape Town called Prodigy Finance, where I was doing a lot of compliance work. And, um, and after that, I, I came to Peach, where I'm also doing a fair amount of compliance work. So, um, yeah, but it's been a really good stay. So during that time, I went from um, software engineer to uh, a line manager to a director of engineering. And now here at Peach, I'm the head of engineering here. Cool. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Stefan de Klerk. So my journey in technology probably started 2011, a little bit before that, uh, was starting and failing on a couple of uh, companies. Um, and then a, c a couple of friends of myself started a company called Be Savvy in 2011. Uh, that went through a couple of iterations. Um, by the time I left uh, that startup, it was called Limitless Technology Group. Um, it was a, a data aggregation company that we used for budgeting tools turned out to be credit uh, affordability technologies, uh, etc. And through conversations with Capitec on, on that, got to, got to become friends with, with a lot of people at Capitec and uh, joined that team in, in what was an innovation team at, the, at that time. Uh, the product I'm responsible for now at Capitec is uh, an outgrowth of a project uh, in that innovation team. Um, and yeah, we're busy scaling that team. So. I can uh, maybe share a little bit of things not to do as well. That's my speciality. So uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm Shaul. Um, um, these guys make me feel quite old. I've been in the technology um, space since about 2002, so um, quite a few years before these guys. Um, yeah, so I started off on a um, kind of in a in more than Java game, software developer, but um, around 2009 or so, um, I joined Mixit um, in Salambosh. So um, I was fortunate enough to work for quite a successful South African mark, um, startup then. Um, stayed there about four and a half years, so that was um, quite a nice experience to be part of. Um, uh, after Mixit, I worked for a couple of small startups. Um, Nothing that uh, unfortunately um, shot the lights out, but uh, got some good experience there. Um, and then you know, about uh, three and a half, four years ago, I joined uh, Wanda only as state of the engineering. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, so, yeah, obviously, moving on to our topic of scaling tech teams, I thought, I thought I'd break it into two pieces. So let's start by talking about scaling technical systems. So when it comes to scaling your architecture, what advice would you give other engineers, especially, you know, being in payments? Since you <laughs> right, um, yeah. I think the the answer to all of these questions is going to be it depends in many cases. Um, yeah. um, I think as much as there are things that you can do and think about, because I think any system at any point in time will will have its limits um, sort of hidden, so you can put a benchmark against the system and you'll very quickly find where it's going to fail. But that's sort of like a hidden limit unless you do that benchmarking. So um, you really you really don't know until you've hit a, an oh no moment as in like, oh, we've had 5,000 people now climb on our system and now it's not working. Oh no, what do we do? And so um, I think there are many things that you sort of jump to, so you, you, a lot of people read, and you may think, oh, the solution to this is Kubernetes. That's how you solve the scale problem. And I don't think that's always the solution. So I think you really have to evaluate what in your system is breaking and how it is breaking, and then, and then figure out, okay, what are the things that you can do? 
but there are also other things that you can do to sort of prepare for those events ahead of time to sort of know, okay, this is the direction in which we're moving and that's how you get there. So I think the, the thing to get, I've gone around the bush, the thing is don't jump to the first thing that you know. Like actually stop and really evaluate how to get to that point. That's probably one of the most important things you can do. If you just jump to the first thing that you know, you're likely going to be um, also playing an unknown territory and you, and you might just be climbing into more hot water later on. Um, I think one of the important things for, for us is um, having kind of full visibility, um, I mean, throughout your architecture and your system to, to, to try and find out where you're speaking about where, where things can go wrong when, when the system scales, when, when the load increases. So, um, I mean, of course, working at the e-commerce um, company, I mean, Black Friday is a, is a big event for us every year. So, um, I mean, it's something that we, we, we spend months kind of preparing for, for that 10 minutes after midnight to, to make sure the system holds. So, um, I mean, we I mean we spend I mean days and months um, scaling our system or preparing us to scale our system, to making sure we've got our um, visibility throughout our system um, to make sure that you know where the vulnerabilities lie in it. Um, and, yeah, so it's it's just something that, that, that takes a lot of time. Um, and, yeah, just repeating that the visibility is so important to know exactly where we can improve. Awesome. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think Rob mentioned a little bit about this. Like, there's so many different ways to architect your software. Um, and, again, advice for engineers or people who are building systems. How do you go about choosing the right... Well, I say right approach. I don't know if there is a right approach. Maybe there isn't. Um, yeah, this is this is a good one. I think it depends also on like how much time you have. So if you have the luxury of time and you know that you're going to get into a position where this is going to be a problem, then I think the best thing that you can do is get familiar with like a few different options. So just like a carpenter, if all you have in your tool belt is a saw, it's going to be very hard to like nail in those nails. So it's trying to get familiar with a lot of things. Do POCs with a few different things, understand the limits of those things and how they sort of fit in. And then when the problem comes up, you know this is the best tool for this type of a problem. Um, so like doing a bit of research and development, having that innovation in the team is super important. Hackathons, those sort of things. Because what it does is it allows engineers to experiment with those technologies that they're reading about, try new things, and then they put that tool in the tool belt for when that time comes. So if all you're doing is working on the same stuff that you have, you sort of get like tunnel vision around like how you solve it. And so you often will try, I don't know, you, you'll have like say for instance a Lambda, and the Lambda, if that's all you know how you make, um, you'll, you'll use it to generate a report. And then all of a sudden the report gets really big. And so it crosses over that 10 minute threshold and it falls over. And then you're like, oh no, what do I do? Uh, if all you know is how to do the Lambda, you're like, well, the solution is, let's make that SQL statement more efficient. And so you write the SQL statement more efficient and it goes from 10 minutes to eight minutes. And this will keep going. And then, you know, like a couple months later, the, 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 the person that's supplying you with more information gets bigger and bigger. And then you start sweating more because, you know, that's all the thing that you know. So. If you know like different options, oh, maybe we use a long run service instead of this Lambda for this use case, all of a sudden you're not trying to solve that problem one dimensionally. And so like getting familiar with multiple different ways of solving for scale is a, is a really good thing to do. So if you're not solving those problems, start experimenting with things. That's, that's the safe space because you, you don't want to get to that oh no moment and then you try fix it and then you have another oh no moment and try to fix it. So you want to be able to like get ahead of that curve. Yeah, I think the one thing I just want to add to, to that is you can maybe just, when you define a proof of concept, keep it to a proof of concept. So what worked really well for, for us at Capitec Pay, uh, we had a version one of the solution that we threw away completely and re-engineered from, from scratch based on the learnings we had from that, that first version. But we communicated to our stakeholders from the get-go that that's a pilot, that's a POC. We're not going to reuse any of this going forward. And while we, we had that, that pilot in production, we started planning, okay, where's the bottlenecks? Built that into our architecture from, from day one of the scalable solution. So don't be af afraid to just throw away an entire product um, and replace it with a scalable one that you built in parallel. 
Uh, I can think my fellow. I can see my fellow panelists. Um, are they working companies very well funded? Because um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, uh, I would love to have just thrown away our back end that we've had for ten years now to to build a new one. But unfortunately, we haven't haven't had the luxury like of, of that yet. Um, I mean, to speak of like kind of solving the problem um, um, of the scaling, I think it's also important to keep it simple. I mean, I often say to the guys that these aren't new problems you're solving. Like people have solved these problems before, but use the tools that you know on, on how to solve the problem. Like don't go jump on the web and tell me there's a new framework and we need to upgrade that framework and that's going to take all the problems away. Like it's usually something a lot more simple that you can use or just use your existing knowledge to try and kind of find where the problem is and, and solve it. Um, I know it's often difficult with, with engineers that they, their friend or somebody they know is busy working on some new framework that's going to solve all the problems in the world. Um, so, so that's usually the thing in, a, in my environment that I have to try and do is try and get our guys to, to, to stick what they know like, um, and yeah, solve the problem that way. Awesome. We can start, uh, you can start since you have the mic on the next question. I feel like maybe it's kind of related. So my question is like, do you know of any good resources that can help engineers learn this? Because you're talking about sticking to what you know. For those that don't know yet, where do they go? And like, like you said, these problems have been solved before. So how do they find out how they've been solved before? No, I mean, I guess everyone knows the internet, so it's all there. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and you're joking about that, and I was making a joke earlier about the kind of age difference, apparently, in, 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 with me, uh, so that, um, I mean, the knowledge that we have on the web is, like, it's new, like, but it's, it's a given at the moment, and, um, but I think it's also a, a challenge in, 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 in still challenging the engineers themselves to try and, and f try and look and so try and solve the problem themselves, like, not kind of immediately reverting to going to Stack Overflow or wh wherever to try and, um, uh, find a way to solve the problem. There's important learnings that you have to go through to, to know when and that's almost one of the most important skills for these guys to learn is when's the right time to, to kind of go and look or, 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 or learn something. You you also need a kind of a base understanding to be before you can find a problem um, or solution on the web. Yeah, we also have a, a Okidev session every week in our team where, where the team can debate, share and, and show and tell what they've learned throughout the week. I've never been invited to that session personally, um, but I know they have it. Um, and, and yeah, the guys are really excited for, for that session every Friday. Um, I read this article, uh, listened to this podcast, etc. And, and they can share it internally and uh, yeah, looking forward to one day joining that session internally. Um, awesome, yeah, so in terms of like your resources, I think this is also quite a, a broad spectrum of things. So it can come down for like, you know, sometimes that, uh, that scale, that problem in scale is, is not just like a small component, but how a series of components is like interacting with each other. And so it's, at some point, like you, you don't want to get to the point where you're throwing away systems. That's for sure, right? But sometimes you, as you grow a system, because it's inevitable, change will happen, and change happens all over. We don't question the underlying model that uh, these things are built off of. And so, like for instance, you could, as you develop a piece of software, you start understanding the domains that these software. Uh, lean into. So like at Peach, we would have, say, merchants. That's a big, strong domain. There's many things that we do with merchants. And you may not have built your software. It might just be like a ball of mud. Everything all squished into one database. So when you get to the point where like things are falling over, um, it's good to start saying, start at maybe the very bottom and say, okay, is, is it maybe the way that we've architected this? Is, is, is it the, maybe do we go to a like domain-driven design? Do you maybe think about like restructuring your code such that like you can put all the stuff that's really dependent and really being used a lot in specific spaces with the function, the sort of capacity that it needs so you can abstract things out. Um, so, I mean, all these things are all types of abstraction. So you can do domain-driven design or event-driven design. You can look at like the fundamental level. And if that sounds still, then start looking at the next layer, which is maybe your technologies that are 
trying to service that uh, those domains. And at that point, you can start saying, well, is it fit for scale? Like, I love Ruby. Ruby is like the language that I love. And in, in some cases, it's, it's good for scale. So it's like GitHub is built with Ruby and Shopify, but they're doing some magic underneath the covers to get it to work for that scale. So if you just think, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna be, to be able to build the next uh, GitHub, you're going to run into like performance problems. So sometimes it's, it's going to be handicapped by the technology. So know the limits of the things that you've built. Um, so it's the, the domain, then the technology, and then sometimes it's just the inefficiencies in how we've used that technology. Um, and so like getting familiar with, uh, with like your own skill level is also very important. So having people to come and question your, your stuff, one of the practices that we do is that every single pull request can, is like sort of broadcast for any team member to look at. So you can get a broad spectrum of scrutiny. So people can come in and question like, oh, I, you know, the, the person that knows the best about SQL in our team may be Craig. And if everybody's code could possibly look by him, he may be able to say, oh, here's an inefficiency. And so you kind of get the best out of everybody in your space. So look at that problem from different spaces and leverage those resources. There are loads of good books around like how to structure your uh, your your system from like a modeling perspective, so your domain-driven design, distilled domain-driven design. There's loads of book about event-driven design. There's yeah, d driven design. Just type that in, and Google will fill in all the stuff that happens before. Um, from your, like your technology suite, there's often technologies that lean very closely to yours that are performance or fit for a different purpose. So the best thing to do is um, sharpen your axe. So if you if you gave me like six hours to cut down a tree, I'd spend my first five hours sharpening that axe. Learn what's out there before you just start implementing a stuff, right? Learn the capabilities of those things, do a bunch of reading, and then experiment, try things out. Um, I guess it's really relevant here because like, we're dealing with a sort of scale that isn't sort of normal in, in many places. You won't see that sort of thing. So it's um, kind of experimental trying things. Thanks, Rob. Um so let's tie this into Sven's talk a little bit. Uh, tech debt, system maintenance, what, what impact does that have? Well, at least how you manage it as a team, what impact does that have on your ability to scale? So in a, in a bank, it might be different um, than, than, than what it is for startups. Now, I remember my startup days, it was always just debates with investors on, on what, we, what we tackle. But we, we always have two teams, one what we call run the bank and one build the bank. Um, that makes it a little bit easier for us. Um, obviously, a team starts with just the, the build, and then you start recruiting for, for, for the run part and, and the maintenance. And that, they, there's two backlogs that I manage effectively, which is uh, the run and the build. Um, so it makes it a little bit easier for, for a bank, I guess. But yeah. Yeah, I think Sven uh, mentioned some, some good, good things earlier about. Um, Kind of making um, like making sure there's some like known things like working the proper way to try and at least limit or or, or try and um, cut down on the amount of technical debt that you uh, accumulate over time. But um, yeah, again, in in a startup environment, I mean that's that's the continuous battle that we fight to to try and get time to to invest in that. Um, I mean, there are customers out there that need new shiny features for us to stay competitive, and um, then there's um, salespeople that want to sell more, and they feel that this or that's going to going to give them the edge um, on, on on doing that. And uh, yeah, and we sit on the tech side worried about something like technical debt, right? So, um, I mean, how we try and manage it, I mean, it's something that we try and be clear and open communication about it in our in our annual planning. I mean, we we try and identify long in advance things that we know we have to work on. Um, um, I mean, we know our system well, so we, um, and we try and keep that conversation honest throughout through all the stakeholders, so everybody is aware of it, making sure that everybody, like when you speak about something that's going to be in technical debt, or what you need to fix, or what you need to improve on, so that the head of the sales team doesn't, like, so that that person, not he, she, they, um, <laughs> know what you're talking about, so that they can also start fighting for it down the road, so that you get everybody in the organization to fight for whatever that technical debt is, um, even if he, she, they doesn't understand exactly um, 
um, what it means or why it's important, just making sure that organizationally, like, everybody gets on board um, with that. I'm going to just copy what Charles said. Um, I, it's such an important thing that you, you come, I mean, uh, Sven spoke about it, that ubiquitous language. You all can talk the same thing. If you all have that same understanding about what's happening inside, technical debt um, doesn't become as big of a problem, but it, it manifests in many different ways. So you, it's, it's like, it's, and this is why like, there's been so many talks about technical debt. There's no silver bullet that solves this thing. It's hard work. It takes time. The, you're fighting against entropy, and anything with entropy and chaos is that it has, it doesn't want to be reasoned about. It doesn't want to be modelled. And what we do as software engineers is take these real-world things that are subject to change, and we try put them into a system and constrain them. And it doesn't care about what we think it is. It will change. And so. Um, it's it's a it's something that you have to be prepared for, and the better, the quicker you can identify that it's happening, that you start seeing that disconnect, the, the more f like flexible you stay in in addressing that. Um, but it's it's going to be a thing that I I think that every team will suffer with, and it will be something that every team will have to like figure out because. It, yeah, once you solve that technical debt, it's going to manifest in a different way. So you have to be on your toes all the time and, and sort of solve it as it comes. Maybe just to add one more thing to it. I think it's also important in a company to understand like what's the cycle in a company of, of how things happen or features or planning. And I think it's important to also try and understand when's the best time in your company cycle to kind of address this technical debt. Um, I mean, so we've experienced like in the beginning of years, uh, beginning of the year is a much better time for us to do it. Um, and of course, late in the year, um, I mean, sales is always kind of people that build up towards the end of the year when they've got the targets to make. So in, in during that time, the pressure from the business is a bit heavier on us to try and focus on more feature development. So, but I mean, so that's our cycle, how we work to, towards say November and festive season. But I think it's important in your business to understand what are the kind of the ebbs and flows and then try and adjust your technical debt kind of time around that as well. So, the second part um, of this panel is just to talk about scaling the company culture and, well, processes, hiring, things like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think we were chatting before this a bit about hiring. How do you make sure you hire the right people? Yep. <laughs> uh, just make sure they study electronic engineering at Stellenbosch University. Then it's a good start. So. <laughs> um, but I mean, it's, it sounds boring, but I, I think it's, um, I mean, so there's like, um, I think somebody joked earlier that there's like, a, obviously the demand supply problem that we're all aware of. So it's not, um, I mean, it's not a problem that's going to go away anytime soon. But I mean, as all of us are working different organizations, I mean, ultimately I'm trying to solve my problem of hiring and getting the right people. So if I have to go through a known similar a repetitive process to find people that work well in my team in my organization then I'm going to stick to that and try and try, try and keep that um, kind of stick to that so I think it's important to make sure that you also understand do all the individuals that work well in your organization and and get the right people to, to, to fit into that um, that kind of helps as well with the probably the culture question that's coming down the road as well that if you if you if you if you hire kind of initially kind of in the right direction, then then, then that kind of also gets easier down the line. Yeah, cultural fit is probably the biggest tick box we need to tick when when recruiting. Um, it's the thing that 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 needs to make sense for everybody. That also means in the interview process, be transparent and upfront about who we are as an organization um, so that it's fair for, for both parties um, in, in that process. Uh, for example, we we are definitely a hybrid type of company. We, we need people in the office. That's the way we build culture. Um, and if, if that doesn't work for, for you as, as, as somebody that applies for a position, and, and you would know what works for you. So be transparent about who you are as a company um, and, and then 
yeah, talk, sp spend time on interviews, getting to know people, try to, to do in-person interviews. That's hard today for, for us as well. Um, walk around the building, uh, talk about their experience. And at the end of the day, skills can, can and I'm sure everybody knows this, but skills, skills can be taught. It's really finding that, that right individual. That, and, and it's not just company fit, but also team fit. Very important. Yeah, um, be very picky. So this is the, so we have Noel right over here. Uh, we interviewed a year before we found Noel. So when I told him that, his eyes were like, what? Um, and that's it, we, we yeah, it's, a, it's, it's for, the, for those really important roles, be picky. So uh, you don't have to be picky with every single person, but for those people that you know are gonna do a specific type of thing and you need them to do that thing, find the right people for those things. Everybody else, find people, there's this really great graph, I like it, where it has motivation on the one axis and competence on the other one. Mm -hmm. If you find some people that are like super motivated for the role and they're low competence, it's fine. If you're really motivated for that position, you will learn things very quickly to solve those problems. And that is a bit of a range. You kind of move around. So you might get projects that you're less motivated on, but you're really, really competent on with me and anything to do with compliance. That's where I fit on that scale. Um, but uh, but you like yeah you want to sort of make sure that people are really motivated to do that job and things work out. So like a lot of the engineers that I, I've worked with, the vast majority of them have had technical degrees or something like that, but not all of them. I've worked with people that have studied like psychology, worked as BAs beforehand or accountants, and they got sort of brought into that domain because they're really good problem solvers. And so what you're looking for is is other things. It's not exactly, you know, can you solve the reverse of binary tree really quickly or solve these sort of algorithms in the, in the test. It's really like, how do they think about their problem? Can they articulate it? Can they try to solve it in their minds? Uh, so what you're trying to do is find those sort of people that are like interested in your domain, interested in trying to solve the problems. Um, and so one of the tricks I do, maybe this is something I should be keeping secret, is that when people interview, I tell them like all the bad stuff I tell them like everything that's like ho going horribly wrong that I know that they can fix because then they're like, I know how to fix that. And, <laughs> and then they will want to join because they're like, I can fix that problem for you. And you say that's a big problem. They want to be these people that solve problems. Um, and that's been like a really great way to like find the right people to help us solve those difficult problems. Yeah, I just want to echo again what you said about being picky. If, if you hire the wrong person, it's going to be more trouble a, a long term, um, rather wait a year like you have um, than, than spend a year trying to make a person that doesn't want to fit in a role fit. Um, it's gonna, the, that's not technical debt, that's, that's HR debt and it's just as bad. Um, and then yeah, a sort of related question, I mean you all are you know, leading big teams, as that scales, you're not going to be able to be there for every single one of them. So the people you hire, how important is it that they have some abilities to mentor and coach each other? Yeah, it again depends obviously on, on that role that, that you hire them for. And if, if you see you want to grow this individual into a leadership role, but also that changes over time. You identify skills and, and passions over time um, and people's interest and skills change as well and give them exposure, see if they like it. If they don't, uh, they, can, they can move into a different role. So be flexible. Um, and, and then if it is a leadership role that, that you hire for, then again, be picky, picky on that and don't hire managers. That, that's just my only advice on that, I guess. Yeah, I think for me, it's really important to have really close and personal relationship with those people in your team that um, are going to potentially mentor um, um, new people um, into your um, into your organization or in, into the team, um, so that um, I mean you so that you can more understand and uh, what you can expect that person on how they're going to mentor people into your team as well, right? So. At least, um, if you know that person so well, then you, you it also aligns your expectations on how that new person is going to grow into your in, into your team. Um, 
I mean, it, it just helps again with the, with the culture thing as well. Like, if you know person A is like uh, like he drives hard, and, like he's good at mentoring people, but he's quite hard on them. Then at least you know as well the, the the one or two new guys that he's mentoring in the team that you maybe need to play a different role with them because you know that they're being driven quite hard by person A because he's very hard on on how he likes things to be done where somebody else might be kind of like a different type of mentorship and I, and I think that in, in, in our organization which is I think still in the size where I can still have kind of a, a kind of relationship with with a lot of people in the team or most of the people in the team I think that that, that, that helps with, with that um, <clears throat> I think uh, I have a lot of these like little sayings and so maybe my next job should be writing fortune cookies for tech companies I think um, but one of the things that I, I like doing is hiring people that are way smarter than me in every way right so and like Noel will crush me when it comes to databases Finn I, I can't even keep up with what he knows with DevOps right and so sometimes uh, the, the engineers get into the space where they are comfortable with hiring people that know less than them because they kind of like the idea that they're very senior people. That's something that we have uh, tried to set as like a cultural shift. You're only hiring people if they're way smarter than you because it brings up everybody's average. And I guess the thing that I've had to learn in this whole space is becoming comfortable with discomfort that my ideas of what really good is and I have like nice roadmaps in my mind of where we're going to take this, this product and this team and the, the tech problems. These much smarter people than I are going to have different problem, uh, different ideas, and that's great. So uh, I kind of my job is to say it depends, and then to look at other people and just nod with what they say. <laughs> uh, and I found that that re that works uh, that works quite a that works quite a, a, a lot because it spurs that conversation. You get the uh, challenge of ideas, and and at the end of the day, like I think that's the, one of the biggest things. It's like lean on your team, and and it's okay to be the person that actually doesn't really understand the solution to that problem, uh, even if you're the boss or the manager or whatever. Um. So I have a closing question. I'm hoping you're not going to say it depends. Um, <laughs> so what do you love the most about scaling tech teams? This is such a good question. Um, <laughs> because scaling tech teams is so difficult. And uh, I've been through this now. This is my second time. So it's very rare. I must say, if you're in a company that's scaling, stay there to go through that because I promise you now it's an opportunity that you don't get to see often because companies that scale period is quite short um, and it's also very uh, it's so bumpy and full of difficult things I've learned more from being in scale companies just because of the things that go wrong and I think that's uh, that's the thing that I like. It's not that I don't want things to go wrong, but there is so much to learn. It's really like one of the spaces where, like, it, you go to a place after this, there's a startup and it's all cool and chill and people are trying to figure stuff out. Um, you're so well equipped to handle everything that they're going to go through. You actually may feel a little bit bored. Um, so, yeah, for me, it's the, the thrill of the amount of stuff that you're going to learn um, and, like, stuff that you've never seen before yeah for, for me it's it's really seeing individuals blossom um, just hiring early on junior people and and see where the, where they end up in in just a short short amount of time um, and even encourage them to to chase passions if, if even if those passions aren't within in your team it, in itself um, or even in the organization um, and I've, I'm still friends with a lot of teams I've, I've worked with previously. Um, so it's it's about the individuals. That that's the joy of scaling teams. It's it's really getting to know people really well, seeing how they develop, um, and then learning from them as much as you can. Um, I'm sure everyone that works for me is smarter than I am. So yeah, I can echo that. Yeah, I think it's um, a lot of what you guys said is, uh, I think it's the excitement of going through that kind of like steep curve or that, that bumpy ride and 
um, almost creating that friendship with somebody at work that you would have with, with your friends or if you went to varsity or to hostel or whatever like that kind of friendship you have but that's just for the guys that you went through some some technical difficult times so I think that, 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 that that's great um, I mean just a month or so ago um, um, I went to for some pancakes on a Saturday morning with one of my friends at mix it like both of our kids are like now 10 and 12 years old and we were next to the sports field I mean we had wonderful times together um, building apps together so it's like it's kind of a nice friendship you build as well with guys like that but um, and um, as you said Stefan when with kind of when you more in a hiring role is like seeing how people like how people grow in, in, in their career I mean that's I mean something that's wonderful for me to to see that kind of like oh that's a good one like that's a that's a good guy that you that you got into the team and look how it's growing and like um, one of the first things I say in an interview with especially with young guys is like like don't worry I, and like this is not going to be your last job and, and it's often their first interview as well so um, like as long as you come in and enjoy it and enjoy the ride and learn a lot and solve problems then it's going to set you up for for your career so it's, it's wonderful to see these guys that um, kind of grow in their career like some of them move move overseas and, and have have a wonderful time over there. I think that that's exciting part for me. Thanks guys for sharing. Um, so yeah, thanks Stefan and Charles for joining us. Um, I think, yeah, we've got some goodie bags for you as well. Um, but yeah, let's take some questions. I mean, I think it comes back to um, again, a situation where I'm, I'm maybe fortunate enough to kind of have a little bit of my finger on a lot of people on the team. But I think it's so important to, to know your people, understand your people. Um, I mean, uh, I've got a guy on my team that's, I mean, the best backend guy on my, my, my team, right? He, um, he, he comes from somewhere in North East Africa, I think. Um, but it's it's one of my challenges at work like when I mean, the guy can solve any problem he's amazing when we ever have a problem he's the right guy to go to but um i mean talk to him about like physical health things as well and about his family and stuff like that and it's i think it's so important to 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 know how to talk to your different people to um and engage with them in the right way to um kind of stimulate that relationship and their mental health health as well so they know that they've got um, at work as well they've got somebody that they can talk to as well so that um, when you need to press on them at work or need to demand something from them that you've got something to fall back onto as well and not that you're just seen as the, the boss that keeps asking I want you to work hard I want you to do more I want you to do that um, I think it's so important to, to do to, to get that kind of relationship with them as well yeah, I think I'll, I'll be the first to admit that it's probably something Capitec has not gotten gotten right yet. Um, I think we we at the stage where we can admit that that it's it's a problem. How we address it, I I don't know. Um, through COVID, it it just highlighted the challenge. Yeah, exactly. It it it, it escalated. I'm personally I struggle with that that myself. Um, just because we're so busy, we don't even have time to to just catch up and, and have that that human to human conversation. Um, I, I agree, it's critical. I don't have an answer though. Exactly. Yeah, this is this is a super hard question. Um, I'm going to share maybe a quick story of how I've like sort of visualized this. So in high school, I did track, so run, running, and. <laughs> I remember this day so bad. I did 800 meter sprints and I was working my personal best and I came second and I was like completely exhausted. I couldn't even breathe. And then they called for the next race. It was 100 meter sprints and it was me running right then. And I thought, okay, this is how I die. Uh, and so I did the 100 meter sprints and I came like stone last and I sprained my leg and I, I, it took weeks for it to get better. And so it made me think about that a little bit because I was chatting to someone about this mental health and you know, people aren't machines. And just like a pro athlete, if they injure themselves, I'm not saying I'm a pro athlete, um, but if they injure themselves, it takes recovery. And that recovery time can be significantly longer than the time that you actually got that injury. And so mental health being this very real thing, one of the quotes that came from that DevConf was the sort of symptoms that can come out from, um, say, burnout is almost indistinguishable from that from like, high stress or heavy depression and that that for me was like a very real thing 
And so, um, like, yeah, I think the best thing that what I've done, and I don't have an answer. This is some of the things we've done is given people time to like try figure it out. You know, it's it is hard to do that because as an organization, you need to you need to move forward. You need people to like be able to do things. And if they're if they're taking that time to like sort of like recover, that's hard on the on the org. Um, but if but it's often worth it to have those people, those minds. And then the other thing is to get them to point them to places where you know that they're going to get that help. So encourage them to talk to people. Uh, those are the things. But even that's just like a partial solution. So it's such a good question, and it's so hard. It's really, really hard. In addition to that, do you think remote work makes it better or worse? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm very introverted and, and the funny thing is my answer is actually it depends because <laughs> not all introverts are the same. Um, so I think it depends because the people that I work with were introverted in certain ways that I'm not that really just want to be at home and they don't want to necessarily bond with their coworkers or socialize or come to a meetup and then that's fine because that's how they work best and maybe they have other things they need to balance like at home that that I'm a little bit different, where for me, I need to come into the, to an office and see humans every now and then, but I'm also an introvert. So I think, I suppose we have to find out, I'll get to know our people and find out what they need. Because um, it'll be a mixture of things. Because even amongst introverts, you get some that are like more feely, more thinky, more like in between introvert and extrovert. So, so it depends. <laughs> Yeah. So I think the team needs to have a face to face face every now and then. Then that person needs to put on their big boy shoes and pitch for those sessions. Even if you are the most introverted and most comfortable in your space, but it's about the collective, putting the collective closer towards it and, and nothing nothing beats in person interaction. I think that's my view. Yeah, I, I, I wanna echo that and I think one thing that gets overlooked as well is the office itself. Is that office set up for for the right for the team? Um, in in certain parts of our office, it's way too open planned just for for our devs to sit there every day. It's it's not going to work. So make sure your office can cater for it. And then secondly, it has to be team by team, and even sub team by sub team have to have to agree what what works for them. And and I've changed my mind on this probably every other year. So uh, I think it changes, also it changes with the technology. In my startup days, Teams didn't exist as it exists today. We had a bit of slack in the later years. Um, the technology made it easier now, but, but again, people disagree. We spoke earlier about Teams and, and video calls, where I said in, in our team, video is a, you have to turn on your video on every call. But again, for some people, that, that leads to then different, different challenges, like you mentioned, uh, Zoom fatigue. Mm. Um, so, I, th I think it, it speaks to the previous question of, of treating people as people um, and actually, you know, getting to know each individual itself. But then you can't build rules around bad app. There, there's always going to be people then taking advantage. Then you have to implement rules. Um, but uh, the advice then is probably then to just treat the, the bad apples and don't implement policies company wide. I mean, sometimes you need to do some forward thinking. Like you, 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 
I mean, you might have some budgets that you have to, to, to live by. Um, I mean, every, every um, business owner would love to have just a team full of senior people that just drives the product forward all the time and um, pumps out features left, right and center. But the reality is that like, it's impossible to build teams like that almost. It's expensive to build teams like that. It's super competitive to get those guys. Um, and, and getting the junior guys on board, I mean, it might be some forward thinking as well and in investing in, in, in the company as well to, to kind of grow with these individuals. And I mean, often they bring like new ways as well of thinking about problems or how, or how to solve them as well. The, um, yeah, would be my way. No, I agree with that. I think hiring senior becomes harder. You have to be more picky, like you, like you said. Um, and you have to, it, it's, it's really hard and it's going to take more time. Um, there's going to be that, that balance of, of skill versus attitude versus personality. Uh, where if you start hiring juniors, the advantage is you can hire more towards the, 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 the cultural fit, the personality. Um, but you have to do both. Um, and there's going to be trade-offs either way. Um, biggest driver is going to be a budget, like you say. It's the hard truth. Yeah. So speak, speaking in, in trade-offs, right? So yeah. if finding if more intermediate or junior folks can be very easy. You're going to be able to get them really quickly, can get them to start. But then you must know that whatever they're building is likely going to be rebuilt or restructured or rethought of. It may not hit the mark. It may not even work after that space of time. So there's lots of trade-offs that you would make. With somebody that's more senior, you want to find the right person that's also thought about it. So you, to find that person that can work in that domain. Because every software engineer, even if I've worked in other fintech companies, coming to Peach, I've learned so much about the payment space. I thought I was a fintech engineer, and I came here, and I realized what, <laughs> what is actually involved in that domain. And so, like, you won't have, like, a perfect knowledge of that domain. But like I was saying, if you find somebody that's senior, that's excited about the prospects, um, you're likely to get a lot more done in a faster time um, and get to sort of, like, try it out and experiment with it a bit. Uh, so, yeah, it's, a, it's a, about those trade-offs, what you sort of have to work with. Um, a bit of a mix is really good. So senior person and then later on get a junior to like sort of help out with some of the more menial tasks, uh, have them get exposed to a lot of those changes. It's a really good strategy. Yeah, and having that mentoring culture in your company. Yes. I saw a quick hand go up and down. Sorry, I just wanted to add to that. Um, if for some senior people, the juice, like the real spark in their day is having someone to cast their knowledge on to. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't have junior people for them to cultivate, like you guys have all mentioned, part of the joy of scaling teams is, is growing those individuals. And if you didn't have those individuals to grow, there'd be a huge aspect of your careers that wouldn't be absolute filling. I think that's an important thing as well. Cool. Thanks again, everyone.